for this kind invitation, and I'm happy to talk about stress cardiomyopathy. Broken heart, but does it mend? So we've known for a long time, oh, these are my disclosures. We've known for a long time that stress can cause a lot of cardiac disease. We're used to thinking about myocardial ischemia, myocardial infarction, sudden cardiac death, arrhythmias, things like that. And it's best seen when surrounding big events, like, for instance, the Northridge earthquake in Los Angeles. That was about 20 years ago. It happened in January, January 17th. And Bob Vogel and some of his colleagues did a really nice um, analysis of data about cardiac deaths surrounding the earthquake and compared it to the years preceding that. So this is what it looked like in January 1991. There's about 40 to 50 cardiac deaths a day. 1992, January, 40 to 50 cardiac deaths. 93, then came the earthquake. On that day, cardiac deaths jumped about threefold. And that makes sense, it's a big event. But stress is really in the eye of the beholder. So sometimes people think other things are stressful that others of us don't get. So in Germany, they're pretty crazy about soccer. And they actually had the World Cup on their home court in 2006. So you can see the number of cardiac deaths every day that Germany played jumped up because it was pretty stressful. But we've just started really more recently thinking about cardiomyopathy and stress. So Takasuba cardiomyopathy, it's all over the place now. And I honestly just don't remember hearing about it at all in fellowship. But you can see that up until about 2007, there were no publications on Takasubo cardiomyopathy. But now they've jumped up, and they're just more and more every year. So it's really on our radar screen now. I'm going to give you a case. This is actually a real patient of mine, uh, not a real picture, HIPAA compliant. Um, this is a patient, a 77-year-old woman. And she came into the emergency room complaining of chest pain and shortness of breath, really right after hearing about the death of her youngest child. She was taken to our emergency room, and an ECG was obtained, which you see here. So it had characteristic uh, deep T-wave inversion, some ST elevation. She had a troponin at the time, which was about 12. So she had stress cardiomyopathy. So we did what we're supposed to do in the middle of an acute coronary syndrome. We took her to the cath lab, and she had an angiogram that looked like this. So. Takasubo stress cardiomyopathy. It's a non atherosclerotic form of acute MI. And what you see characteristically, you go take them to the cath lab and you see no significant coronary disease. But they have this cardiomyopathy that usually comes, the typical pattern is a really hyperkinetic base with an akinetic apex. Um, that's the typical ballooning pattern. But there are a lot of other patterns, and I'll show you in a little bit later the different patterns that we see. And it's, always, it's often felt to be reversible. It's important to know that about 90% of cases that have been described are in women. And it's typically called stress cardiomyopathy because it's often preceded by this, what's called a lifetime crisis, like the death of a child. But it's important to remember that it's not always women. It happens in men, too. And it's not always a lifetime crisis. So sometimes, again, stress is in the eye of the beholder. And sometimes you can't even identify a trigger. It gets its name from the Japanese octopus trap, Takasubo, which looks just like the heart on an angiogram in patients who have this condition. It has a num number of aliases, broken heart syndrome, apical ballooning syndrome, and stress cardiomyopathy. We don't know exactly what the pathophysiology is, but I've listed the three main hypotheses here. One is that it's coronary spasm, that the stressful event causes high catecholamine levels and you get spasm of a particular coronary artery. I don't think that's the case because when you look at the wall mo motion abnormalities involved, they don't always fall along a single coronary territory. There are usually multiple vascular territories involved. Could it be microvascular impairment? Well, they've certainly, it's been demonstrated that there is microvascular dysfunction in these patients, but it's never been shown to be causative, and there's a lot of reasons to think that it's probably not. We see microvascular dysfunction in a number of conditions, yet we don't see similar conditions. I think it's most likely due to catecholamine stunning of the heart. So there's elevated catecholamine levels in these patients. There's histological findings on autopsy of 
catecholamine toxicity in these patients. And then this study showed some really interesting things. This is just a schematic of the heart. You see at the base, there are all throughout the heart, obviously, there are um, adrenergic receptors. When the receptors at the base of the heart interact with high catecholamine levels, they respond by becoming hypercontractile, just like we see in Takasubos. When the receptors at the apex of the heart respond to elevated catecholamine levels, they react by becoming less contractile. So that would make sense for the, what we see on angiogram. We see a hyperkinetic base and a, a kinetic or dyskinetic apex. But does it mend? Well, the good answer and the, usual, the answer we give our, most of our trainees is that yes. But a better answer is yes, generally, but it's complicated. So this is, I have two studies I want to show you. This is one um, called left ventricular function after Takasuvo is not fully recovered in long-term follow-up, and it's a spe speckle tracking echocardiography study. Small study, they only looked at 30 patients, but they had Takasuvo cardiomyopathy of no 29 were females, which is what we commonly see. The average age was 67, again, what we commonly see. Then they matched them with 20 age and sex match controls, and they looked at cl classic echocardiographic parameters, also longitudinal strain and LV twist parameters. What you see on the right is what they saw with left ventricular ejection fraction. So they found that when you're looking just at these gross so echocardiographic parameters like stroke volume, LVEF, things like that, they all appear to get better over about 12-month follow-up. So this is a 12-month follow-up. Each of the lines there to the right is one particular patient, and you can see all the lines go up and to the right. That means they're getting better. And if you look at all of the EFs at a year's time, they're all within the normal or near normal range. So if you stop there and look at that, you say, yep, it always gets better. But if you go a little bit further, you can see some differences. So they found that the patients who had Takasubo cardiomyopathy had lower mean apical rotation, slower mean peak early diastolic apical rotation, and higher pre-stretch index in the apex. So there were a number of abnormalities in apical indices that they could detect. So their conclusion was, the improvement of LV function in patients with Takasubo cardiomyopathy is assessed by 2D echo, may not always be complete. Some residual abnormalities in left ventricular apical function were observed in long-term recovery following Takasubos. But does it matter? Well, there's no da data that can directly tell you that this is what's the cause of the, ab the adverse outcomes we see in these patients. But a really nice review article published in New England Journal in 2015 really gave us some insight into this. This paper called Clinical Features and Outcomes of Takosubo Stress Cardiomyopathy did a lot of good things. So if you look first at the, the images to the right, it shows you that there's a lot of different patterns that this takes. So we're used to seeing that top pattern where the base is hypercontractile. In all of these diagrams, hypercontractility is dark red, and the apex is hypocontractile. The hypocontractile segments are shown as the dotted, green, dotted blue line. But there's also other patterns that are commonly seen, or at least seen in some cases. So you can see a mid-ventricular form where the apex beats great, contracts great, so does the base, but in the middle of the heart, it's hypocontractile. There's actually a reverse form where the base doesn't contract at all, while the apex contracts very well. And then you can have in all sorts of different patterns in between. So in this study, it was a registry study looking at 1,750 patients, all of whom were diagnosed with Takasuva cardiomyopathy. They found out that the physical triggers were actually present more commonly than emotional triggers. So 36% had physical triggers, 28% had emotional triggers. And really, for the first time, they actually were able to show that their in-hospital de death rates were just the same as every acute coronary syndrome patient. So these patients, even though they may have better long-term recovery, acutely, they have outcomes that are just as poor as everybody else. 
And when they looked long-term, 10-year follow-up, they saw that the risk of a major adverse coronary event was almost 50%, over 40% over the next 10 years. So remember, these patients are pretty young. They're about 67 years of age. Their risk of death was pretty high, too. They had death rates almost 25, 30%. And again, that's patients starting at age 67. So you're talking about a quarter of them or more being dead at age 77, which just doesn't make sense. These patients don't do well. If you look at the very bottom line, that's MI rate. So the future MI rate is pretty low, but other cardiac death issues are, are seen there. So what they concluded was that of 1,750 patients with Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, again, most of them were women, almost 90%, and the mean age was about 67. Physical triggers were more common than emotional triggers, but they said in 28% of cases, they couldn't detect any trigger at all. The rates of severe in-hospital complications, including shock and death, were similar between the two groups. And during long-term follow-up, the rate of major adverse cardiac and supervascular events was about 10% per patient per year. That's crazy. And the rate of death was about 5.6% per patient year. So that's what I meant. It's complicated. So this is a non-atherosclerotic form of acute MI and acute heart failure associated with absence of uh, severe coronary artery disease and that typical apical ballooning pattern. Most of the patients are women. Many, but definitely not all cases, are associated with lifetime stressor. In-hospital mortality rates are similar to acute coronary syndrome patients. Standard measures of cardiac function show that most patients do recover fully if you just look at their EF or their stroke volume. But when you start looking at other more um, in-depth measures, some residual abnormalities of apical function can be seen. So long, and this study in the New England Journal shows that long-term morbidity and mortality rates are really high. So these patients, while may look like they can recover from the acute event. They don't do well long term, so they need close monitoring and follow-up. Thank you very much.